Hi guys, welcome back to the Get By Ready show for this week. Sammy, how are you doing? They're doing well, doing well. Good. Well, this week we want to talk about the smartest things you can look for when buying a property as an investor because we deal with clients um, by nature of what we do at Hello House that bring us properties to examine yep. and we determine the quality of those assets and work out whether or not it's the right fit for what their needs are for their portfolio or for them to build wealth over time. But by nature of doing um, those reviews, we're also looking the whole time for other options that we can compare those to. Plus, we're all property investors, right? So the whole team here love property investing. Uh, we've been doing it for decades. Um, so we've got a really good sense of what we think is the important five metrics that Sammy and I have drilled down into that are key if you're going to be a smart property investor to buying um, the right property that's going to grow over time and build wealth. Yes, Let's jump into it, shall we? Yeah, let's go for it. So there's five key things, the first of which, um, and we're going to go in the right order as well, I think, is a growth location. And I've got a couple of questions for you here. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start with a question. Do you buy something that's going to give you the best capital growth, so you're going to buy outright for growth, or the best return on investment, so the strongest rental yield, or do you buy a balance of the two? So where do we go in here? You're the data brain, the big brain on campus. Big brain. What's the answer to this one? Yeah. What is the best thing to do when you're buying the growth location? Um, common question I get when I'm doing strategy sessions with clients, um, you know, where to buy, um, what to buy. So yep. it always comes down, I know it sounds kind of boring, but it's case by case. So it depends on the individual and what their uh, basically household cash flow position is. If it's um, a strong cash flow, then you would say, well, you don't need that um, income in order to make those future purchases. So let's look into capital growth locations. Yep, that um, makes sense. You also got to analyze the appetite for risk too. So everyone has a different risk profile. Um, and that also is reflective of their their age. You know, obviously, you don't yep. want to be taking those higher risks, which generally the higher cash There's flow. There's big debt on when you're much older as well, which could be a problem mm -hmm. for a lender. Yep. Um, generally, the, the higher cash flow plays... Um, there's always that trade-off between cash flow and capital growth. Uh, for a lot of um, portfolio structuring that I do, it's it's good to get the best of both 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 worlds. Um, but then we also deal with um, high net worth clients as well, who um, are very cash flow rich and are just looking to, um, I guess, diversify their their portfolio into different um, you know, growth locations, which they can then do things with in the future. So yeah, and I guess it depends on where you are in your property buying journey as well. So. If we're trying to build a pyramid of you know property success over time or a wealth plan, then we'll start with a foundation property and then we'll build on it from there. So there's a very specific structure that we'll work towards depending on where you are at in that timeline, depends on the type of asset selection. But basically what I'm hearing from you is it's not a one-size-fits-all strategy. It's very much a bespoke service based on where you're at. Um, but to drill down on this first point, growth is crucial to any portfolio. You want to be buying properties that are going to continue to grow over time. We talk a lot about time in the market, not timing the market. And the sweet spot really is 15 years plus to outrun any negative cycles and to make sure you see, um, you know, fantastic capital growth. And of course, we're talking about historical growth here because we have no idea what the future holds, but we're no. we're bullish on on the property market in Australia bouncing back reasonably quickly. Mm -hmm. And when it does, um, there'll be continued pressure on prices to rise. Yeah, there's a good stat that um, I was looking at. Um, we'll probably jump in the gun, but uh, at the moment in the market, we're looking at um, a massive vacancy rate issue. So yep. sub one percent in Australia. Uh, we've just opened up the borders, so we're expecting an increase of 200,000 people uh, per year from a um, migration point of view. Yep. Um, and then you sort of look at where the supply is, and there's only 50,000 vacant homes available in Australia at the moment. Yeah, wow. And we actually talked about this on last week's show about markets within markets and how broad it is when you can say, for example, what you just said then, that um, rental vacancies are at X percentage. Now, really interestingly for us, we were looking at a property this morning, yesterday or this morning, um, in the stats that was sitting at, I think, over 2%, uh, you know, vacancy rates. So in comparison, some of them we're seeing that are basically at zero and others that are way off that. So within markets, it can change drastically, even within the same city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's why, I mean, we're big from an investment perspective and looking at growth locations it ties in quite well as you zoom out and look at the infill land around you um, you can see spikes in um, 
vacancy rates go up to that four percent, five percent plus, um, yep. because there's just been a development that's been completed, and there's about you know forty homes that have come to the market. All investors have just put it in there. They've been convinced that you know tax depreciation is the only way to uh, make money, or yeah. Um, so it floods the market, and with that flooding, you're not going to get those um, cash flow returns. So. And this is a key thing for us that comes up a lot is that we'll go into a market to research for a client and the agents locally that are selling will say, oh, actually, this buyer's agent has just been buying everything that comes on the market for the last month or three months. What they do is they'll just hook into one particular location and just push and push and push investor clients into that marketplace. And in the short term, that sucks up all the supply um, and there's some pressure on those prices, which often sees a big growth spurt. Yep. And then they turn around and say, oh, well, within six months or three months, you saw a huge uplift in capital appreciation in your price. But it's a false economy for us. And what ends up happening is you fast forward a few years down the track, you end up just with this massive oversupply of investors into these certain suburbs, which hinders capital growth, which is the key point of it. Yeah, so be very cautious of where the sort of hotspots are according to certain industry people that are in the market. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about growth is there's there's a kind of thinking in Australia that every 10 years your property doubles. Mm. Um, we know that on average the statistics say, say that everyone holds property in Australia for on average 13 years. What's the sweet spot in terms of growth? Is it 7% annual growth ends up doubling your property every 10 years? What are the actual kind of numbers behind that? I know I'm putting you on the spot with this one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about <laughs> you don't have a calculator either. 7.2%. Um, if you Oh, boom. He's got a specific number, 7.2%. Yeah, yeah. There well, you go. If you compound 7.2% growth rate over a 10-year period, you're looking at 100% return on investment. Okay. So there we go. So if you're looking for you know, north of 7% returns, that's going to put you in good stead to do well over time based on historically how the markets have performed. Yeah, yeah. Well, historically, it sits between 6 and 8% from a um, capital growth perspective. Um, obviously, you want to outperform that. We talked about opportunity costs in the last yep. week and um, it's more relevant now as well. So um, there are locations that they, they do go 20% in, in 12 months. Um, others, uh, you know, might do, you know, 6 or 7%, but... I like to, once again, you've got to look at the strategy involved with the client. So um, you know, going into those very more uh, riskier locations where you do get that capital growth, it can be a really good play, but you need to have, also have that strategy um, to say, well, you know, if you get this growth over the next few um, years, is there a sell-down strategy in the future as well? Yeah. You can shift assets into a different asset class like commercial or uh, you know, rooming houses or looking at, well, I've made my money. Um, this market's not going to grow anymore, so let's shift it into you know, a more safer uh, location like a, a CBD. Yep, interesting. Well, look, it's nice to be able to sit on the fence like we do and not have a horse in the race in terms of us pushing a particular angle. Hollow House was built um, from the view that I wanted to create an absolutely transparent real estate business in terms of helping people buy and sell. So we're not going to say to people, you should absolutely buy for capital growth at the risk of um, you know, shortcomings in cash flow, or the other way where you've got other property spruikers that are in the industry saying you know, it's absolutely all about cash on cash and you've got to build these huge um, you know, cash piles through regional properties that are going to yield really hard. So we don't have to do that. We've got exactly um, you know, what we've just discussed, a balanced attitude to this, and it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, no, you know, no. Advice, we're able to then guide uh, the right fit for the right person in the circumstances that dictate. Yep, absolutely. And yep. there's there's really good points around the cash flow point of view from a growing your portfolio perspective. Um, but yeah, everyone's different. So you've got to sit down and have that conversation first. If someone's pushing your product to you, there's generally an agenda behind it. So just yep. think about it that way. Yep, cool. Okay, well, that's number one, growth location, which is the first thing on our ladder in terms of making sure we're a smart property investor. The second thing, and something I'm incredibly passionate about, it's less about the data side of it, but also of interest to you, I know, is asset selection, which yes. we talk about a heap. Yeah, well, yep. they say 80% of the heavy lifting is the location, and yep. the other 20% is the uh or asset selection. So that's looking at Statman streets. Statman coming at you. Streets, property types. Um, I like to look at those things too because um, there's a lot of different data houses out there where you can buy data and they can tell you which um, local government areas to go into or even suburbs. But there's so much more to it than that, and that's where you're going to see those those good um, 
I guess, growth metrics coming through. Because if you can focus in on those more owner-occupied locations, then um, that's what the emotional buyer is going to come in and look at when you go to sell, if you do sell. And then from the valuer's perspective, when they come in and, and value it, they're going to be looking at um, similar properties to that. And you're going to get a higher valuation, which can help you draw down your equity to then go and purchase somewhere else. Or Yeah, roll into the next one. Roll the next one, yeah. So asset selection is key. And it's- that might be for us buying on the right side of the street, buying within walking distance to major transport, train stations or buses, buying walking distance to schools, local shops, mm-hmm. short drive to the beach, whatever it might be. It's having a property with the right aspect. So it gets the right natural light, hasn't got privacy issues, not overlooked by neighbours, hasn't got an easement that affects the land, so it might stop someone from building a pool or an extension or a future subdivision. Yep. Um, it hasn't got issues with uh, termites or white ants or subsidence or major issues like that that are going to um, take a lot of capital to resolve and fix. Um, properties that aren't, um, you know, obvious things, fire, flood. Oh, yes. Yeah, these are the key things that we look for. Public housing. Public housing. A low percentage of public housing is important to us in an area. And as you've already touched on, making sure you buy in an owner-occupied area. And that's because owner-occupiers are emotional end users and they drive the growth. So when the market bounces back, they'll pay a premium for the right properties that are in the school zone or tick those boxes because they're emotional. They're going to use that property long-term as their family home. um, And that's what could see that uplift in and that bump in price. Is that it? Key thing with asset selection too, and um, not so much with what we do because it's sort of every, every day, but um, you've got to look at it from the bank size too. So there's lending restrictions on certain asset types. So uh, when I was valuing for the, the major banks, we'd risk things up based on um, either floor um, areas. So in units, anything under 50 square metres is uh, basically a higher risk. Yep. So they only lend... Like 80% on that. Um, anything within 50 metres of a high clearance power line because there's a higher risk, they'll only lend 80% on that. So people won't find that out until they are basically going in and buying or selling their own properties. And that will restrict your... Basically- your buyer pool, yeah, of who, who's out there that's going to purchase it off you, which yeah, so- reduces your, your capital growth potentially. Yeah, once again, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, totally. And that's why you've got to have a checklist, like a really thorough checklist to make sure that you're buying the right asset. Um, we're doing an agent selection for a client at the moment who bought from a buyer's agent that put them into a particular area in Logan. Um, but Sam Simple look at it very quickly years later and said to them, um, yesterday, our advice is um, you're at high risk that there's going to be you know, lots of land releases around that, which is going to cap your capital growth. And that's driven them to a decision to take the loss on the property now and sell it so that they can reinvest and redeploy that capital elsewhere into an asset that's actually going to improve at a much faster rate and be a more secure investment for them. So bad advice from a buyer's agent previously, just pushing the product into a certain area because they know it's an easy sale has led to um, you know them not asking the right questions, taking their lead and buying what is effectively a dud property. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty common, um, unfortunately. It's very, very common, unfortunately. We see this a lot in our industry. Yeah, I saw it a lot... Um just valuing properties where you wonder why people invest in it. But then you see the, the, the shiny brochures and them selling you on tax depreciation and um, the cash flow that you might be able to get out of it. But you, you've got to dig deeper and look at the numbers. And yeah. It's very similar with off-the-plan apartments as well, yeah. isn't it? Or buying anything off-the-plan, including house and land. Um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen a product in real life that matches the marketing material initially and the level of emotive um you know, feelings that that drives up front when you're looking at buying it and the dream of owning that. Uh, so you've got to be really careful because you're paying a premium for that. Uh, and I've sold a lot of things off the plan over the years as well to buyers. Um, but very rarely or never, I would say, have I ever walked into the finished product and said, wow, this is even better than um, what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, so It's actually one of the driving factors of me getting into the industry was seeing people making these really poor decisions. And uh, it's not... Rocket science. Um, no. But, yeah, once again, people with the biggest marketing budget can convince people to, to do crazy things. So Yep, absolutely. Cool. All right, so that's asset selection. That's number two. Let's jump into number three, which is buying properties where you've got a scope to add value to that property over time. So I'm talking things, mate, like, um, you know, updating the kitchens, the floors. You might change car- old carpets for timber floors or replace the carpets. Mm. Paint, update the lighting, do some landscaping, replace fences, anything like that that's going to see an immediate uplift in both the value of the home 
but also give you scope to increase the rent. And that is our fourth point, which is the ability to increase the rent. So when we look for properties, um, you know, we looked at one today, for example, for an investor client of ours that's got uh, scope to create a fourth bedroom, which is only a three bedroom house at the moment. So an easy um, cosmetic upgrade will change that into a fourth bedroom, which will increase the uh, the rent yep. that will be achievable for that property. Um, there's some work that needs to be done to the property. In this one in particular, it's restumping. So the cost of that's going to be twenty to $25,000. But if we look at that and say, okay, well, if we can afford to do that work, how much is the perceived discount we can get off the property? Because the owner doesn't have twenty to $25,000 to do that work. And very often, it's a bigger discount than it actually costs to rectify that property damage. So we're looking at it through that lens the whole time, like what it's going to cost us to do the work, what are the easy wins that we can make? Mm -hmm. um, and you've done this a lot with your own properties as well. So walk us through a couple of really simple, low-cost things that you might do to an investment property to drive the rent up. Well, it all depends on your connections with trades. But as you said, the floor plans are really great. If you can try and find something with um, a nice, easy fourth bed conversion, yep. um, there's even two bed dwellings out there or units where you can do a third bed. But um, as long as you can not sacrifice the total living space, so yep. you want to have at least like a, a lounge and a dining room as well. You don't want to turn it into a youth hostel? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that a lot in inner city Sydney where I was sold as an agent that um, buyers would take that advice to the extreme and, in, and you go back and see the renovation when they finish and basically they turned a two-bedroom house into a six-bedroom house and it's yeah. all like bunk beds and no living space and yeah, it's awful and it's actually detracted from the value of the house massively yeah, removing, even though it's increased the rent. Well, you're removing your own occupier appeal out of it. Totally. So you're sacrificing capital growth for cash flow and, it, and once again, going back to a values mindset, they're going to walk in there, they're going to see 16 rooms, no living area. They're going to be comparing it to other residential properties in that area, which are actually you know, four bed, two bath or five bed, three mm. bath. Um, nothing really compares and you actually get hamstrung behind it. Um, a lot of investors sort of got caught up in the cash flow and the yield and they think because they can have this you know, uh, phenomenal cash flow from the property, then it should yield X percent and therefore, therefore it should be worth X. But in reality, you've got to look at the broad market appeal. Yep. And so floor plans is a really easy one for us to get wins out of. The other big thing we do with floor plans is create a, a dual income stream. Mm -hmm. So we take it from one family residence and we find a way to create a second um, residence out of that to generate a, uh, another income. So very often it's two-storey homes where downstairs has got the right legal height limit. Um, there might already be a bathroom or a laundry downstairs. It can be an easily conversion to a bathroom. We can get a bedroom, a living area, potentially convert the garage. There's a lot of things that you can do easily and at a low cost with just a tiny bit of creativity. It might drive another $250, $400 rent out of a property that you wouldn't have otherwise got. Um, and again, another one we looked at this morning, uh, the rental estimate from the agent for the whole property was $600 a week. The rental estimate for the two, if we did a split, was $800 a week. Now, there's already a kitchen downstairs, already a bathroom downstairs. It was just a matter of do we set it up as two separate leases or do we run it as one? And that was $200 a week. So, you know, 25% extra income on the basis of just, you know, carving that up into two leases. So there's, if you think about it from that and you keep your eyes wide open and you get a little bit creative, you've just got to make sure that you're covered from an insurance perspective and also from council. So yeah. whether or not you're breaking any rules by adding in another livable space or habitable room um, downstairs, it's got to have the right height limits, it's got to have the right airflow, it's got to have um, a private entrance. There's, there's a, a few little things to be cautious of that you make sure you, um, you tick off. But the other really easy cosmetic wins that have the biggest impact on the value, either for rent or from a capital uplift of the value's home. Do we do it at the same time? Oh, well, or... go, give me your top three. No, nah, paint and flooring for me just spices the whole place up looks and re refreshes it and yep. even just a, um, a stone bench top over an old kitchen i was just about to say kitchen bench tops <laughs> flooring and paint oh, so we're, 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 we're bang on up. three out of three so they're the reasonably easy fixes um and a lick of paint will make a huge difference even if you're spraying um joinery like kitchen cabinets um even tiles in the bathroom it can have a huge visual impact on on the uh the the, the look and feel of the property and it's that first impact you know you don't you never get a second chance at a, at a first, impression. first impression so you know you win people over if you can just take that out of the equation that they're turned off by the flaking paint or the old brown walls or whatever it might be um, it's a cheap thing to do it's fast as well and you can even do it diy like yeah. do it yourself if you want to as well to cut the cost out of it as well yeah little handles here and there modernizes it yep. yeah it's good 
makes a big difference to it. Um, and if you're selling a home, this is off point in terms of this, but if you do go to sell an investment property, styling is the other thing that makes a really big difference in terms of um, making sure you find a buyer fast that gets emotionally connected to the home and that you sell for a premium dollars. So that's another little switch up in terms of anyone that's looking at selling an investment property as well. Oh, street appeal as well. We covered on that. Street it's appeal, easy. yeah. So yeah, a little bit of landscaping. You know, it could be laying new turf. It could be just cutting back trees and things like that. It could even just be um, washing homes. Like we used to, yeah. um, they used to call it frog washing in Sydney. That was the name of the company. But uh, you know, if we would high pressure wash houses, terrace houses, driveways, and things like that, they come up looking mm. completely different. You might spend a thousand dollars doing all the windows and and the eaves and things like that, but it makes a dramatic difference on the house. Yeah, that's the thing is like uh, people uh, in their head, they're like, oh, it's going to cost me $2,000 to do this. But people look at, they buy a property in $5,000, $10,000 allotment. So if you can spend $2,000 to increase potential at the very least $5,000, I'd take that yep. trade every day of the week. It's less than a cup of coffee a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why every good auctioneer breaks it down to. It's not $10,000. It's just less than a cup of coffee a day, Sam. What does that actually equate to? Especially when I buy your coffee and you don't even pay. Oh, yeah. Isn't that in terms of conditions? Yeah, yeah, in terms of conditions. We should sign that contract well, at some point. Five copies a day, 360. That's, that's 1,800. Statman's doing the maths that on, the, not on, 10 grand, you're on the coffee a day. All good. So that's kind of three and four points combined together. Scope to add value over time and the ability to increase the rent. So just to touch on that, on one last thing on the increasing the rent. Um, often we'll buy properties that are dated, um, that are currently leased, which is important to us so we know that there's actually an income stream from day one rather than buying something that's an unknown quantity. So aim to buy something that's already leased or already owner-occupied, that's rentable straight away, but it's got the ability to increase the rent and it may just be through the fact that it's under-leased. Yep. So we'll have a lot of agents that say, well, it's leased at $310 a week and we'll say, Okay, great. And we'll go and ask an independent property manager, what's the actual market value today? And they say, oh, we'll get 400 bucks a week for it all day of the week. So the lazy agent puts the existing rent on rather than the projected rent that it would get in the open market. And there's an opportunity for you, right? right? There's an opportunity to say, okay, great. Well, let's not run our numbers on 310 a week. Let's be running our numbers on 400 a week. And how do we get it to that rate? Or how do we even push it to 420 by doing some of the items that we just said just then? I've got a good story in my past life. I, uh real estate agent was advertising a property for a rent at 370. Uh, it was actually the rent from 12 months ago. So it was at 420. And then there was a rent review coming up in a month's time. So on their ad, it was 370, but the market rent was basically sitting there at 480. Yeah. But it took all the investors out of the side because it was yielding around 3%. So most of us look around that 5%, yep. um, 5% plus. So I looked at it and that only just took digging further with the agent to understand that and then even the agent figured it out and then changed their advertising but by then we had under offer so yeah and we've done this a lot the property in southport that we we mm. looked at buying a couple of weeks ago we did the maths on it with an independent property manager and then we went back to the agent to clarify why he's saying it was worth x and why we had independent advice at another number and he went instantly straight into realestate.com and changed the ad and put it up at the higher level so, you know, you do find these things. It was because we didn't want to buy the property anyway that we were happy to have that conversation. Otherwise, I never would have raised it. But um, it's interesting that even the agents that are representing the sellers get it wrong and often. So, you know, do your research. It's great to have an independent property manager that you can lean on and get their own um, opinion as to the market value. And, of course, ask for them to be realistic. Don't get this optimistic number that you have to make a decision on. Um, you know, we talk about this often about over-leveraging and, um, stretching yourself and um, if, if it you know if it has to work at 400 a week um, but it's only really worth 360 a week then you're going to get caught short every mm. week uh, it's all good for a property manager who wants to win your business to tell you it's worth 400 but you know you need to have realistic numbers to work from so whatever they tell you just take a little bit lower than that as, as your calculation so you can run that through your spreadsheet and make sure that you're not going to be out of pocket every month yeah what was that development site we're looking at at the moment uh I was looking around four hundred dollars a week, and then cutting up the land. But then the appraisal came in at five hundred to five thirty, but it wasn't reflecting that it was on a um, local thoroughfare road. So, yeah, just take it with a grain of salt. Do your own research. No one's got your interest at, you know, at heart as much as you do. Um, so and, veer on the side of caution with all yeah. these things with numbers. Great. Yeah, big thing I say is uh, don't invest in it unless you understand it. So oh, deep. Well, yeah, that's a that's a, that's a trademark. Good line. 
Well, I'll give it to you. Man. Sammy Power yeah. trademark. Hello All right. House trademark. Hello House trademark. I'll take it. I'll take anything I can get. Great. Well, that's three and four combined. So let's jump into number five, which is long-term development potential. And this can mean many things to many people. But to simplify what we're talking about here, when we're trying to find a property that has these five credentials, it's got to be in a growth growth location. It's got to be well-selected assets. That's so got to be the right property in that location. We've got to have scope to add value over time and we've got to have the ability to increase the rent and we've got to have this long-term development potential. Now, it doesn't mean knock it down and build 40 apartments. It might mean it's a corner lot with a simple, easy subdivision. It might mean a typical house on a reasonable street, but it's on a bigger block of land that meets the minimum lot size for us to do a battle axe where we can do a subdivision that way. It might be the ability for us to add a granny flat at the back. Yeah. Could be any simple thing like that. Um, we get a lot of corner lots that we chase um, because they can typically be turned into two townhouses or two villas or sometimes three on a traditional yeah. residential block on a corner. Yeah, larger road, road frontage, so town planning is a bit more relaxed. Yep. And and how we go about that is um, we work really closely with town planners. So, again, we'll outsource this to a very specific expert who knows what they're doing and he's more clued into this locally than we are. So we'll lean on the professionals for help. We'll ask what can be achieved on that site. And this is what most agents in Australia completely miss. They're looking at it saying, okay, I've got 15 Smith Street. Um, It's worth X based on these comparables. And I've got a seller that's willing to accept a price if I can hit those numbers. They're not thinking about what else this can be developed into. What's the long-term play here for a winner, you know, for a property investor? Very often, they're not property investors themselves. They're not property developers themselves. They're not looking at it through that lens So if you can have that focus um, that this is one of the key points to buying smart when you're investing long term, that it's got to have some sort of development play. You may not ever want to do it, but if you want to sell it to someone else in five years time or 15 years time, that there's some upside that we can focus the marketing on to make sure you extract every dollar out of that sale and get an absolute premium result. And better still, if you can hold on to it long term, that when you come back to it and say 10, 15 years, 20 years when you retire or closer to your retirement, for example, that you may have a development play that you can activate that might be an income stream for you later on. Yeah, you have a different net worth and you're happy to take the punt or you get a DA on it and flick it off. Yeah. Multiple different strategies on the exit front as well. Yeah. And and I use this term quite a lot, but it's just paper shuffling at the end of the day. So a lot of this is um, thinking really smart about what the potential is, but to unlock that value is often just applying to council or getting a town planner to do it for you. It is not outlaying huge amounts of capital, your hard working capital or savings to develop a property. It's simply just getting development approval for that to be done. Now that alone is gonna be an uplift in the value of your property, but then you've got that potential to sell to someone else if you don't wanna do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, anything else to add on that one? No, keep it simple on this one. So top five, let's rattle them off, hey? We've got growth location, then we go asset selection, Mm -hmm. very key. Number three, we've got to decide to add value over time, uh, which is very important. And then we've got also the rental capacity. So we're increasing that from a cash flow perspective. And then the development potential. So your five key areas are super important when you're investing in property or even buying owner-occupied to actually think about it. Well, when you do go to sell it, if you can appeal to multiple markets, then you're going to attract that value. And then the chances are you're going to have a higher capital value at the end of the day. Yep. So, yep. yeah. One last question. What's the ideal hold period? Uh, say 10 plus years, but um, 15 years would probably be where I would sit because you're going to see at least two cycles, hopefully. So 15 um, years, kids, is the sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. So generally right. markets running, what, seven to 10 year cycles. But if you're buying sort of at the tail end of one, you're going to miss the peak. You're going to have to ride to the trough. And then. Uh, and I think they're getting shorter. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that last week. Yeah, actually. those cycles are getting shorter. It seems a lot more volatile, and I think that is because we have access to communication, like um, media and whatnot. We're a bit more um, emotionally vulnerable to see what's going through. Whereas in the past, I mean, I remember the days when TV just started. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're showing your age. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, digress. Oh yeah, I'm all done. good. All, <laughs> good. Done. all good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning into the Get Buy Ready Show this week. That was fun to have a chat about the uh, the smart property investors and what to look out for. So, if you've got any questions on that, reach out anytime and ask us. 
Um, if you want our advice, we would be more than happy to help, even just um, run our eyes over a potential asset that you're interested in buying if you want to go it alone. Um, and don't forget, the best buyers get educated. So tune in here every Wednesday to learn from us in the Get Buy Ready uh, group, but also go and get access to the course. It's getbuyready.com.au. We've got a buyer coach that can help you um, get through that with any questions that you've got as well and make sure you're not an industry statistic, which is hard for me to say. Yep, um, I'll spit that out this week. Uh, and make sure you buy faster and you buy smarter and for less money. So we'll leave you on that note. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, guys. See you Bye. later.